What up, everyone? Turn to the person next to you and say, wow, you look good tonight. Now turn to the other person that you so rudely ignored and say, you look all right, too. But there's a reason why I didn't turn to you first. You don't have to say that. Hey, I'll have you know, this is, this is a vow I have kept. I have yet to fulfill. I have yet to fulfill this vow, but I have kept it. Can you keep a vow without fulfilling? I don't know. But let's just say I'm like up here or someone's up here and they tell you to turn to your neighbor and tell them that they look good and all of a sudden you fall in love because you strategically sat next to her for some reason or you sat next to him for some reason. All of a sudden, before you know it, sparks are flying. Five years go by. If you're like 18, five years go by. You're getting married, and you're like, you know what? The reason why we're together is because Matt told me to tell you you look good. I'll do your wedding for free. You just let me know. I know. And let me tell you, as one who has recently gotten married, pastors sometimes are stingy with how much they make you pay to marry you. So I'll do it for free, which is like, it'll save you some money. Put towards the honeymoon or whatever it is. You don't care. You're like, Matt, I'm 15 years old. Sorry. Hey, um, if we've never met before, my name is Matt Velasco. I am so glad to be with you tonight. Um, my job is to lead Next High School, and all that means is that I get to hang out with you guys and you gals every single week, and I love doing it. It is the greatest privilege of my, my life beyond being a husband and beyond being a Chicago Bears fan. I rebuke Jacob's prayer in the name of Jesus. I ask that it is not received um, in your name, Jesus. Go Bears. Is that appropriate? I don't know, but I did it anyways. Hey, um, like Sam and Jacob said, uh, we say something around here. We say something around these parts. We say that tonight is the best night of the week. And we say that because we really, truly, firmly believe it. And we don't believe it just because we get to get free food, because you get to jump around and have fun, because you get to hang out with your friends. But we believe it because we think that God has a habit of showing up on Wednesday nights, and not just showing up, but showing up in really special ways, and that's what makes Wednesday nights different than Mondays, and Thursdays, and Tuesdays, and Fridays, and Saturdays, and even Sundays, and so I'm so glad that you have chosen to sacrifice one night of your week to be here. I would really encourage you, if you are new, first of all, if we haven't met yet, I would love to meet you. Please come introduce yourself to me before you leave tonight. Um, but come back next week. Don't just try it out once. Like, try it out a second time, and you're going to hear me next week say, if you, hey, if you're here for the first or second time, come back again. Like, really try investing into Next High School, into this family that we have here, because I, I firmly believe whether you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus, you will be thankful that you can call this place home, that you get to be a part of the best night of the week. So if you are new, thank you so much for, for being here. So I was just going to say how many of you just started the new school year, but you all did. So how many of you um, had to do awkward get-to-know-you games in your classroom this week or last week or the week before? So, so how many of you had to play Two Truths and a Lie with a random stranger? Okay, so Two Truths and a Lie historically has been my absolute favorite get-to-know-you game. And truly, it's not because I think it's actually fun, but because it, I oftentimes, like, get them. And what I mean by that is I oftentimes get whoever I'm doing it with to think that the, the, the lie is actually true. And so we're going to play a little game of two truths and a lie tonight. And I'm going to give you two truths and a lie because that's how the game works. And just by a show of hands, I want you to vote on what you think is a lie. Make sense? Thank you so much. Okay, so I got three of them. The first one, I was born with one ear. I was born with one ear. That is truth or lie number one. The second one, I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm. The third one, I am a quarter Mexican. I'm a quarter Mexican. So if you think that it is a lie that I was born with one ear, please raise your hand. If you think it is a lie I was born with one ear, please raise your hand. Maybe you're like, Matt, you have two ears. This doesn't make sense. Okay, you can put your hands down. 
Raise your hand if you think it is a lie that I grew up on a farm. Nice. Okay, now raise your hand if you think it is a lie that I am a quarter Mexican. Okay, you can put your hands down. So usually at this point, I, I've been playing this game, and I look at them, and I'm like, gotcha, you wrong, because I am a quarter Mexican. And then they look at me, and they're like, you're not Mexican. And then I usually pull out my phone, and I show them this picture. So, first of all, you're probably asking yourself, Matt, are you allowed to show this picture in church? <clears throat> Those are my great grandparents. Would you like to hear about them? First of all, and importantly, they were, we think, illegal immigrants from Mexico. They crossed over illegally as migrants, and what did they do? They joined the traveling circus. Suddenly, everything makes sense. The clown up top who gives me nightmares, kind of, not really, but I do actually have a cousin who literally nightmares, reoccurring nightmares from our, I think that's like my grandpa's cousin. I'm not sure. I don't know. And so it is this chick on your right. Your left, this chick on your left, is my great-grandma. The dude in the middle is my great-grandpa. No idea who the chick is. No idea. That's my family. I love it. I can't grow a mustache like that. I wish I could. And, and, and so, usually the jaws drop, people laugh, and, and I show them this picture, and they're like, oh, I couldn't believe you're actually telling the truth like you actually are. And... and, and for most of my life, people have had such a hard time believing that my family is actually my family. To the extent that if you are Hispanic or you are from Mexico or you are from Spain, the, the name Velasco rings a little bit of a bell because it's a much more common name in Central America, in Spain. To the, to the extent that I was on the phone with a bank person like a week ago, and they were like, are you from Italy? And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm from Minnesota. It's pretty much the same thing. In, in fact, the only brown Latino in my family is adopted from Mexico. My grandma has a nickname for all of us grandchildren. She calls us Wados, white Latino. And, and, and even still, when I tell people, they, they do not believe that my family is really who they are. And likewise, for most of modern history, many have chosen to look at Jesus's genealogy and say that there's no way his family is who they say his family is. They scoff and they say there's no way that's real. But friends, let me tell you this, just like it is real that I am a quarter Mexican, so is it real that Jesus was an actual person that walked this earth? You see, you, you would have to be a fool, quite truly, to reject the existence of Jesus in history. The two most accurate and, and astonishing and well-respected historians of, of human history, one of them whose name is Josephus, you've probably heard of him, they affirm the existence of Jesus. And so do Jesus' genealogies. You see, I, I want you to hear me when I say this. It's very real, Jesus' existence. And the implications are very significant. So I ask, what might it mean if Jesus really was God? But also, what might it mean if Jesus really was human? So we're going to be continuing and actually wrapping up this short two-week series that we are calling Jesus Said, which is also going to be our theme for the year. Last week we covered uh, uh, Jesus' genealogy in the book of Matthew, and this week we're actually going to be covering it in the book of Luke. And, and we're starting in these genealogies because we um, really need to set up who Jesus is. Because I, I firmly believe if we don't understand who Jesus is, if we don't understand who Jesus is, then we won't understand or even trust the words he has to say. And so you might be wondering, Matt, why are we starting here? Like, what does this have anything to do with what Jesus said? Hear me when I say this. It has everything to do with what Jesus said. Because if Jesus isn't who he said he was, then everything he said means 
nothing. So what better place to learn about who Jesus is and his genealogy? So if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 3, starting verse 23. I'm going to warn you. You thought last week's genealogy was boring? Buckle up. But then I'm going to tell you why it's not boring. Isn't that fun? You're going to read it, and you're going to be like, wow, this is boring. And then hopefully by the end, you're going to be like, that wasn't boring at all. Starting in verse 23, if you do not have a Bible, you can use your phone. You can read it on the screen. If you want a Bible, we will get you a Bible before you leave. Just let me know, or your leader know. Starting in verse 23, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. Being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathet, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Matthias, the son of Simon, the son of Josic, the son of Joda, not Yoda, Joda, the son of Joanan, the son of Resha, or Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri. You're like, how can Luke make a genealogy even more boring than it even is? Just like, the son of this, the son of this, the son of this. Are we done, Matt? No, we're not. Verse 28, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kasim, the son of Elmadam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mathet, the son of Levi. You're not crazy. There are repetitive names the son of Simon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melia, the son of Mena, the son of Metatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Selah, the son of Nashan. Everyone take a deep breath. 33, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu. Actually, I'm going to start at verse 35 again. I want you to pay careful attention to these names because it gets so good here. 35, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxed, the son of Shem, the son of Noad, the son of Lemek, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared. The son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan. Like, my name is Mahalalel. What am I going to name my son? Jared. <laughs> the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. We made it. Hey, let's take a second. Let's take a second and pray and thank the Lord for what we just read. Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you that even though we can ramble these names on and at the surface it may seem like it means nothing, that when we dig deeper into the layers of Scripture, we see that there is so much gold. God, I pray for the student right now that isn't sold, that they should even care. That you would just pluck away at their heart right now, Lord, and just give them a glimmer of why they should care. Lord, would they hear that? The son of Adam, the son of God. Lord, we sit in that, the truth of who you are. Lord, we submit this night to you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. And, and so you may have noticed a few things different about the genealogy that we just read in comparison to the one from Matthew. And, and I'm actually going to give you three major differences. We're not going to spend a ton of time on them, but I just want you to be able to pluck these out and see them because they're actually really fun. So the first one, they'll be on the screen for you. This genealogy is actually given in reverse order. Last week, uh, this is an aside, last week you all received a notebook. We want you guys to take notes, just like your high school teacher tells you, just like your mom and dad tell you, whoever it might be. Writing it down helps it solidify it in your mind and in your heart. And so feel free to take notes. That's why we gave them to you. If you need one, um, we've got plenty for you. If you run out, we can give you another one, whatever it might be. So the first one, this genealogy is actually given in reverse order. What I mean by that is it actually starts with his dad, Joseph, and goes all the way back to the beginning, 
whereas Matthew's started with, do you remember who? Abraham. Yes, Abraham. Started with Abraham. This one starts with Joseph, Jesus' father, and it actually flies past Abraham all the way to our favorite who is Jared. You're right. Thank you. Jared. Jay, can we name our kid Jared and say that's why? Where are you? Like, why Why did you name your kid Jared? Ah, Jesus' genealogy. <laughs> why not? I think that's great. Why do I have a thing with, like, names? Has everyone noticed that? Like, last year was the exact same thing. Names are, I don't know what it is. <sighs> Anyways. <clears throat> so Matthew started with Abraham and David. So if you remember, it said, like, the son of Abraham and the son of David. It started there, and it went all the way to Joseph, whereas it starts with Joseph and goes all the way to, well, Adam and God. And so that's the second thing. The beginning for Luke isn't actually Abraham. So the beginning of the genealogy isn't actually Abraham. It's Adam and then God. So it ends. So it's the end of the genealogy, but it's actually the beginning of the genealogy because it's the first people in Jesus' lineage. You tracking with me? And it starts with Adam and ultimately God. Now, why is this important? Because it is astonishing that God would be mentioned in Jesus' lineage in Jewish culture. We're going to talk about that here in a second. And, and third, and this is my favorite like little, like you, you think you understand what Scripture is saying, and then you realize that you really don't understand what Scripture is saying. And third is this. It, it, on the surface, it seems like this is... G- Jesus' genealogy through his dad, Joseph, because it says, Joseph, the son of Heli. But if you remember, Matthew lists Joseph's dad as Jacob. So Matthew says Joseph's dad is Jacob, and Luke says Joseph's dad is Heli. And this is an instance where you might be talking with a friend, and they're like, see, the Bible contradicts itself. One of them's wrong, but what they refuse to do and what they're not doing is digging deeper to figure out why is it saying it. Of course, the Bible is not contradicting itself. In fact, this is actually Mary's bloodline. So this is the genealogy of Jesus through his mother Mary's bloodline. Why could that be? We're going to come to that in a second. I want to unpack these three points a little bit today as we talk about why it matters that Jesus was fully man. So all fully man means, for those of you that may not know, if you're new to this whole church thing, is that Jesus was just as human as you and I. He bled, he wept, he slept, he pooped, he did all the human things. You know, you can get a kid's book called Jesus Pooped. It's real. Jesus was just as human as you and I. Whereas last week we talked about how Jesus was fully God, also known as the Messiah, the one who was sent to save us from our sins, and how Matthew's genealogy helps us to understand that. And we asked this question, if you remember, what might it mean if Jesus wasn't just real, but really was God? This week I want to ask you this question. What might it mean if Jesus really was God, but also really was human at the exact same time? We as Christians believe that Jesus wasn't just God, and he wasn't just human. He wasn't 50% of God and 50% of human, or 75% of God and 25% of human, but he was 100% God and 100% human. That is a foundational belief to Christianity. You remember last year we talked about the, the theological triage, die for, defend, discuss. We would die for the fact that Jesus was both fully man and fully God. And so what might it mean if Jesus really was God and also really was human at the exact same time? And so why could it be, to go back to this, that, that, that Joseph's father is a different person in Luke's genealogy versus Matthew's? Many solutions have been put forth by various biblical scholars much smarter than me, but the one that seems to be the most likely is this, is is exactly what I said, that Luke is actually giving us the genealogy of Mary, not Joseph. 
Now we have to dig into that a little bit to understand it. In fact, we have to dig into Jewish tradition like we did last week. If you remember last week, I said that very rarely women were included in genealogies. And likewise, genealogies were never traced through the mother's bloodline. Unless she had no brothers. If the mother had no brothers and got married, then, and this is weird for us, but this is what happened way back then. If the mother had no brothers, but got married. So Mary had no brothers and married Joseph. Mary's father, Healy, would adopt Joseph as his legal son. And so once Mary and Joseph got married, Mary's father, Healy, would have legally adopted Joseph to be his son and his heir. And so when it says that Joseph's father is Healy, it means it literally, legally, not by blood. So... And I don't want to get lost too much in the weeds here. I will say you thought genealogies in the Bible were boring. I hope this is proof that they're not. There's a lot to it. It's weird. I love it. Matthew gives us the bloodline of Joseph. Whereas Luke gives us the bloodline of Mary through the adoption of Joseph into her family. It's kind of weird. I get it. But this is how the ancient Jewish folk did it. And so I'm just going to let them be. But the main point of the genealogy is actually what it ends with, which is verse 38. If you can put it back on the screens. It says this. The son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. This is a jaw-dropping ending. In fact, there is no parallel anywhere else in Scripture or anywhere else in any ancient religious or Jewish texts. It is astonishing for a genealogy to begin or end with God. One scholar actually describes this as Luke shouting for attention. And so what does Luke want us to understand? Like as we look at this, what does Luke want us to understand? He wants us to understand that Adam was the literal son of God in the sense that all humans are the offspring of God. Paul actually echoes this in Acts 17, verse 28. He says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we indeed are his offspring. As the first man, the first human, Adam can be referred to as the literal son of God. But Jesus, the eternal son of God, has become part of the human family and its brokenness. Like we said last week, that the creator, Jesus, entered into the creation. He became a human. And even still, you may ask, why does this matter? You might be thinking genealogies are cool and everything. At least some of you hopefully are thinking that. But why does it actually matter? Like, okay, Matt, I get it. Jesus had a family, but don't we all? Sure, he was related to King David, and sure, you can trace it all the way back to Adam, but technically, can't we all trace our lineages back to Adam? I'm sure many of you have thought something along those lines these past two weeks as we've been talking about this, and you're doubting why this even matters and confused as to why you should care. So, if that's you, I want you to hear this. The reason why this matters, particularly why it matters that Jesus is the son of Adam, is because it means that Jesus can exercise his perfection as God and take on the sin of Adam, which is the brokenness of all of us, and can redeem it and make it new. Let me say that one more time. The reason why this matters is because Jesus, being the son of Adam, means that Jesus can exercise his perfection as God, 100% human, 100% God. He can exercise his perfection as being 100% God and take on the sin of Adam because he is 100% human and can redeem it and make us new. In fact, Paul actually tells us this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, and Romans 5, 17. He says this, For as in Adam all die, So also in Christ shall all be made alive. We all die because of Adam. And all those who believe in Christ shall live. 
He says this in Romans 5, 17. For because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Because of Adam's sin, death permeates all of existence. Much more for those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness shall life reign through the one man, Jesus Christ. So just like death reigns through all of creation because of Adam's sin, so also does life reign in all those who believe in Jesus. But not just life, but even more life than there ever was death. God intended for his son Jesus to take on the bloodline of Adam and the guilt of Adam in order to die a death that brought us freedom from the chains of Adam. See, people ask, Matt, sin isn't actually real, right? Like, is there actually any proof of this brokenness that you Christians talk about or that you pastors talk about? Like, it works for you to talk about brokenness, but, like, people don't actually believe that. To which I say, what was your first action as a human being? And I'll ask you, what was your first action as a human being? We all have the same one, probably barring medical circumstances. Cry. Now, have you ever considered what the implications of your first act as a human being being shedding tears mean? Well, there's actually like a a legit reason. By crying, you're doing two things. You're allowing oxygen to enter into your lungs And so the very sign of sorrow and pain is actually what brings us life when we come into earth for the first time. But the second thing it does is it tells the doctor that we want our mom. And so what do they do? You give birth, the baby cries, and they give it to who usually if it's a healthy birth? The mother. Your crying says that you are reliant and need another person. Brokenness in this world looks like two things. It looks like sorrow, and it looks like a need for someone other than yourself. Because if you weren't broken, you'd be just fine on your own. And so people ask, give me proof that I am broken. You're born. You're a human being. That means you are broken. Do you get sick? Do you have pain? Do you experience sorrow? Have you experienced loss, death in your life? Maybe you've been close to death yourself. Brokenness permeates this world. And God intended for his son Jesus to take on the bloodline of Adam and the guilt of Adam in order to die a death that brought us freedom from the chains of Adam. We call those chains original sin here in the church. All that means is that we believe that we are all born apart from God and are in need of rescuing from someone much better than us whose name is Jesus. See, God is pleased to offer us his son as a replacement for our sin. We actually hear this pleasure when he says to Jesus upon his baptism, you are my son whom I love with you, I am well pleased. And it's because of Jesus' sinless 30 years that he is pleased. It's because of Jesus' atoning, all that means is sacrificial death, that he is pleased. And he is likewise pleased that the flawed children, us, would be redeemed by the blood of the flawless and triumphant Jesus. I don't want you to get tripped up on all this Christianese language. Like maybe you're new to the church and you're like, Matt, why are you talking about your God's blood? Atoning sacrifice? See, that brokenness I talked about, there's a way for it to not be broken anymore. And his name is Jesus. And we believe that Jesus dying for us, literally dying for us, the most gruesome death of all of human history. And I don't just say that. Historian scientists have actually proven that being crucified is the worst way to die in all of human history. Because you didn't just die of, like, having nails in your arms or your wrists. You actually died by choking on your own blood. 
And if that didn't do it, they'd just stab you after a couple of days. Like, it's a gruesome death. They actually tell us it's the worst way for a human to die. Jesus did that for you. To the point where he was sweating blood beforehand. And it's because of that that when we believe in him, we receive salvation. It's because of his sinless 30 years that God is pleased. It's because of that sacrificial death that he is pleased. And he is likewise pleased when we put our faith in Jesus. And so like I said last week, nothing that Jesus matters, or excuse me, nothing that Jesus said matters if he isn't God. Nothing that Jesus said that we're going to talk about this year matters if he isn't God. And likewise, nothing that he did matters if he isn't human. Like nothing that he said matters if he isn't God and nothing that he did matters if he isn't human. If he isn't 100% human, the crucifixion means nothing. If he wasn't 100% God, then everything we have in our Bibles means nothing because then it's just another man who did it. And so when we ask, why does this matter? That is why. The point of this whole message, and what I want you all to walk away with tonight is this. Christ, the Son of God, became a real human and died a death that we deserve to die so that we might become sons of God or daughters of God. I had someone say this to me yesterday. I actually think it's, it's really profound. Every single human being is an image bearer, but not every single human being is a son or daughter of God. In order to be a son or daughter of God, you have to believe in Jesus. So I would ask you, are you a son or a daughter of God? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Do you want to? Maybe now you're like actually feeling like, oh, that's what that is. That's brokenness. And I didn't actually know someone could heal me of that. Like I didn't know like I could actually not feel that. Well, I'm telling you, you can. And and maybe all your life, all you've ever wanted is for someone to look at you and say, you are my son or you are my daughter whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And I can tell you that tonight, if you put your faith in Jesus, God will look upon you and he will say, you are my son or you are my daughter with whom I am well pleased, whom I love. Like a son, like a daughter. But God can't say that to a flawed humanity. God can't say that to a flawed human. But, I love it when scripture says, but God, because it means that like there's a really bad thing, but then God does something that makes that really bad thing into actually a really good thing. This person on TikTok, normally I'd say, don't listen to anyone on TikTok when they say anything about the Bible. Don't do it. But there's one TikTok that says, it's like a, like a joke preacher, dude. maybe you've seen this. He goes, That's a really big but. I like that really big but. I'm going to say, when God says, but God, we like that but. Should I have said that, Jake? I don't know, but I already did. I can't take it back. It's on video, okay? Sorry. But God says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. She is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Friends, I can tell you with the utmost confidence that he can say to these new creations, you are my son or you are my daughter, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. But let me tell you, he's not pleased with what you've done. And I'm wrapping up now and we're going to sing one more song. He is not pleased with what you have done. But he is very pleased with what Jesus has done on your behalf. And so as we look at Jesus' genealogies and we move into next week, we're going to talk about the temptations of Jesus, which is yet another uh, signal to us that he was indeed human. I, I want to just land the plane and, and, and I want to talk about three different types of students. There's the student who is new to their faith. Maybe that's you. There's the student that isn't quite new, but isn't quite old in your faith either. Maybe you've been following Jesus for like a year, year and a half, two years. 
Maybe you went to winter retreat last year, you gave your life to Jesus. Maybe you went to a young life camp this past year, you gave your life to Jesus. And then there's a third student. It's a student who's grown up in the church or has been following Jesus for a really long time. For each of you, I have a different application for these two messages. If you are new to your faith, I want you to understand that Jesus actually walked this earth and there is a ton of proof. You're not following some fairy in the sky. You're following a real man who actually lived and walked on this earth. And that matters. And he is speaking to you right now. And you can have all the confidence in the world that your Jesus is real. The second, if you've been following Jesus for just a little bit, not quite new, not quite aged in your faith, allow this to remind you that there is still so much in the Bible that you can discover. Like maybe at this point you're beginning to feel that like early in your faith high or spiritual like juice start to wear off a little bit and you're like, ah, okay, like now I actually have to like change the way I'm living. Like, oh, now I actually have to do something different. I need to treat my parents differently. I need to stop drinking. I need to stop watching porn. I do whatever it might be. And you're like, ah, that's a little too hard. I think I'm going to back away a little bit. Or maybe you're like, open up your Bible. And you're like, man, Matt, when I first got saved and I would open my Bible, the Lord would speak right to me. For instance, I'd read Esther 5 verse 1. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes. And for some reason, that spoke to you. But now when you open it up, you're like, they wrong the barren, childless woman and do no good to the widow. And you're like, how do I take that, Jesus? L let me tell you that there is so much in this still for you. There's still so much in this for you if you just dig a little deeper. And finally, if you've been following Jesus for a long time, maybe even most of your life, and I'm going to plead with you for this one. Because I have a feeling this is going to be a lot of us then this should be a reminder that you too need to remember that Jesus was indeed a real man who died a real death for you. And you might be like, Matt, why are we going back to the first point for those who have been following Jesus for a really long time? Because for so many of us, we lose our awe in the gospel. We forget the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and it gets so easy to get caught up in wanting to know more Bible trivia and lose our love for the gospel in the pursuit of knowledge. See, you can know a whole lot and be the best Bible trivia person out there, but you cannot know Jesus. You can forget your first love, who is Christ. So let this be a reminder that he is real, and he loves you, and you need to love him too. Do not let the gospel lose its awe. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your life. Thank you that you are real, that you chose to enter into creation, God. We don't deserve it. And yet you've given us this grace that we call salvation, Lord. Or maybe you're just beginning to waken us up to this salvation, Lord. I pray for that student. Would they come to know you tonight? Lord, we love you so much. We praise you in your name. Amen.